start looking at uh, even hard money lenders or either private investors that, that can work with you. Hey, what's going on guys? Jeff Koga here and I decided to do kind of a late night talk and uh, this uh, late night talk is more for my podcast listeners but I figure I talk about can you really flip houses without cash, credit, or experience? And the reason why I want to talk about this is because number one, I'm in some interesting transactions right now where I think I can actually uh, talk from the heart and give you some insight on if you can really do this without cash, credit, or experience flipping houses. And also, I had a podcast listener who actually reached out to me and shot me a, a message on Facebook saying, hey, thanks so much for talking about the real estate stuff in Los Angeles. So this is kind of for you you know who you are and uh, uh, because you reached out I'm doing this so let me kind of put some stuff uh, give you kind of the short answer and then from there kind of uh, give you kind of a long answer all right can you actually flip houses without cash credit or experience now the answer is yes you can but there's an asterisk next to that actual answer all right now what do I mean by that okay the one that actually requires you, you know, the one that you need the most, okay? Do you need cash, do you need credit, or do you need experience? The asterisk is next to the experience, okay? I cannot stress that enough, all right? Why is because experience is literally kind of uh, what I like to call intellectual capital that you have, right? Meaning that it, what type of knowledge do you have between your left and right ear in your actual uh, brain that's gonna allow you to uh, put a deal together? right and really you do need that to actually you know flip houses without cash or uh, uh, cash or credit okay now when I got back into the real estate game okay because I started in 2004 when I had that one I didn't have any experience but one thing I did have was a little bit of cash and I did have credit okay so um, the real estate market was completely different at that time but because I had those two things um, I was able to leverage other people's experience and get into the real estate rehab business and I was able to rehab a house when I was 19 years old make over 50 grand and uh, I thought I was king of the world until the real estate market crashed and when it crashed, um, clearly the lack of experience showed and I was literally caught with my pants down as I like to call it and uh, I had to reinvent myself and when I did that, I gained experience and with that experience, I was able to do deals without any of my credit. Why? Because my credit was shot and without any cash. Why? It's because I didn't have any cash at that time. You know, Literally, I was tapped out and the little cash that I did have, I was actually leaving it in the stock market so that way I can actually trade stocks so that way I can actually eat all right so with that being said can you do it 100% now is certain marketplaces a lot easier to do a deal without uh, cash credit or experience 100% okay if you're outside of a metropolitan area I'm 100% I'm a believer that it's a lot easier all right. Um, how do I know that? Is because one, I have clients of mine, I have students of mine who have gone through my trainings that have done much better. But when they actually go into a hyper competitive marketplace, they absolutely struggle if they do not have any experience in real estate, or two, uh, they don't have any business experience. Now, if they have business experience, they don't struggle as much versus the people who have like traditional real estate experience. Traditional real estate, in terms of hierarchy, right? Um, the people that succeed, I see. In like a competitive market is one if they have business experience and especially if they have like marketing experience right they do really well all right now the second tier behind that is people who don't have business experience but they have real estate transactional experience meaning like they did loans or something like that and I'm um, talking about people who are like mortgage brokers who have to generate leads themselves right they do typically a lot better why is because they understand what marketing is and they understand how important marketing is right so so those do a little bit better than the traditional real estate folks who just gets listings okay uh, they struggle a tad bit why is because 
I think they developed some bad uh, marketing techniques and or uh, they've been actually relying too much upon the referral business. They struggle when it says, someone says, hey, you gotta learn how to lead generate, okay? So, so that's kind of the hierarchy. And then people who don't have any real estate experience and or business experience, if they're in a hyper, hyper competitive marketplace, there is a learning curve, okay? I'll tell you that up front. I've seen it over and over again and uh, it's a challenge, okay? Why is because you have to think differently and then not only you have to think differently, but you have to actually gain uh, kind of the experience on being able to figure out which pockets are the best when it comes to uh, generating leads, okay? Um, so, can you do it? Yeah, you can. Okay, are there challenges? 100%, but what business do you not have challenges, okay? Someone that tells you otherwise that, hey, it's uh, you know, walk in the park or whatever, I think is just blowing smoke up your you know what, okay, in my reality, but uh, can you do it? 100%, okay? So let me give you some tangible examples uh, right now on a deal that I'm working on. I'll give you two right now, and an interesting uh, text conversation I had uh, with one of my team agents, okay? So we're texting back and forth on a deal that we have. Um, this deal is currently being wholesaled right now, and it's in a particular city. Um, I won't say what city it is, but it's in kind of the rougher parts of Los Angeles City. And this duplex currently right now is being wholesaled, and we have an offer accepted by the buyer. Now the assignment fee on this is only like four grand or something like that. Okay, so it's a very marginal, marginal deal. Okay, and uh, um, we're waiting on the EMD or the earnest money deposit to come into this actual transaction. Action. It was supposed to come in last Tuesday. Okay, now currently, as I'm recording this, this is Monday, so it has been past you know, you're, you're way past your contractual obligation of you have to have your EMD within like the first three business days. Okay, I'm um, sorry, three uh, calendar days, right? Okay, in California, it's three calendar days, so, so we were way past that because it's not Wednesday, it's not Thursday, it's not even Friday. We already passed Saturday, we already passed Sunday, which was Easter, and then now it's Monday as I'm recording this about Monday at 11 30 p.m. as I'm driving home, and uh, um, the EMD is still not in. And the text message I get was saying, Dang. Well, I'll kind of paraphrase it. It says, damn, why the hell is the EMD not in? And I basically texted back and says, I gave an emoji sign of the kind of the poo-poo or caca emoji sign. And I said, what wholesalers have to go through, LOL, okay? And then uh, he texted back, I believe it says uh, L-M-A-F-O. And then I said, yep, always the marginal deals are the most difficult ones to close. And it is so true. The marginal wholesale deals are always the most difficult to close. Why is because you as the wholesaler, right, you're selling the dream to the other side, okay? I cannot stress you that enough, okay? Uh, if you talk to a real wholesaler and they tell you that they have never actually sold a deal to an M buyer, okay, they haven't done enough deals. And or one, they're leaving way too much money on the table. Okay, the best wholesalers know how to sell, know how to actually excite an M buyer and to be able to um, borderline, I wanna say convince them to buy a deal, okay? Now, I say the term convince very loosely, but um, your, your ability to sell is going to, you know, your assignment fee is gonna be predicated by your ability to be able to sell, your ability to pre-frame, your ability to actually position a deal uh, to be able to have them buy, okay? So, to a point, where in the heydays when I used to do tons and tons of wholesale deals, right? Um, within our organization, we used to literally categorize cash buyers into different categories. Um, you might think it's kind of weird, but we used to uh, categorize them into, um, we used to call them uh, third rodeo investors, right? We'll start off at the top, third rodeo investors. And third rodeo investors are literally investors that um, was been flipping houses since the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s. Okay, those are what we call the third rodeo investors, meaning that they have seen the up and down cycle at least three times. And because they have seen that, they have practically seen everything in the books in terms of negotiation tactics, in terms of you know people selling you a pipe dream and a half on why a deal is so amazing, okay? Um, those are third, so they're very, very sophisticated investors, okay? And then we have the second tier, of um, which we like to call the second rodeo investor, all right? And the second rodeo investors are the people that w went through just one up cycle, okay? Meaning like maybe they started in the early 2000s, or maybe even they started started in the 90s, but they weren't doing huge volume, but they saw the up cycle, they saw the crash, and they're back in it again uh, in the market cycle. That was considered like the second rodeo. And then we had like kind of the first rodeo investor, which means that they just started investing after 2008. 
okay? And then we had kind of like really the, the lower tier, the fourth one, which was kind of like, we used to say, the wet behind the ear investors, okay? And I know I'm saying that in a very kindest way possible because I used to be that, so don't take it the wrong way if you're new, okay? Um, but we used to say that. Now, why, why did we actually categorize those people, okay? And why did we categorize the investor into the four, those four different categories? Is because when you start doing high volume of deals, okay? I'm talking about you got like, you know, 15, 20 escrows open at the same time and I'm underwriting and I'm looking at all of these deals at one time, meaning that and when we got that type, type of, you know, deal flow going through, that means that we were literally writing tons and tons of offers, okay? Offers being accepted, okay? So when you have that many deals in the pipeline, right? I just did not have time to ask my guys, hey, what about this investor? Right, I just basically said, "Hey, what type of investor are they?" And they would say, "Hey, no, nah, they're a third rodeo investor. No, nah, they're a second rodeo investor. No, nah, they're a first rodeo investor." Or they'll say, "Hey, they're a wet behind the ear investor." Right, and that really categorized them to allow me to thin slice a deal to know what propensity it had to actually close. Okay, so here's what I mean. So if we had a marginal deal. And I would ask them, says, hey, what kind of buyer do you got? And they'll be like, dude, I got a second rodeo investor. And I'll be like, damn. I says, okay. And if they said that, then the chances of it closing, if it was marginal, it literally became like 50-50. So I would be like, hey, you need to sell them on the next deal that's going to come up. Right? Why is because they're looking to buy more deals, so you need to sell them on that next thing. Okay, not just this one. You need to sell them, say, hey, we got other deals. Okay, that's a constant line that you want to use. Now, if it's a marginal deal and they'll be like, hey, man, it's a third rodeo investors waiting for the deposit to come in, then if they said that, then typically I would have been like, this probably deal is going to fall apart. <laughs> okay, and or if that happened, then I would be like, immediately contact my acquisition guy up front and I'll be like, dude, go request and go set up the actual seller to request for a price reduction already. Why is because I knew the chances of that deal closing was really, really slim, okay? Really, really slim. Now, if they said something like, hey, you know what? Um, this is a wet behind the back of ear investor, then I'll be like, dude, um, and I'll tell my acquisition guy to say, hey, start apping this property with a hard money lender um, so that way we can actually have a hard money in place already so that way they don't have to go raise the money if they don't have all the money. Okay, and that's how we would set it up. Um, so that way, you know, it would be a lot easier for the newer investors who have never done deals to be like, hey, look, man, hard money lender already approved this at this resale value, and all you have to do is come to the closing table with this amount of cash only. Okay, so when you said that, for example, like this deal that we're doing, right? The contract price is what, like 425, right? So when it's apt with the hard money lender, right? The amount that you have to bring to closing is only gonna be like 30 grand or something like that. And then they're like, ah, I don't know if they'll actually go ahead. Uh, the resale value is gonna be at this price. At least I had a third party who would vouch on that and be like, hey, look, our hard money lender said it will come in at, you know, 620 or 590 or 600, whatever it is. And then they can actually look at the actual what a uh, pre-approval of that hard money loan and they'll be like oh okay it makes them feel warm and fuzzy inside and they'll actually move forward with it okay and those are some of the stuff that we did heavily in los angeles and we moved exact same strategy now it's going to be really difficult for you uh to close if you don't have those kind of like bullets in your revolver to fire back at a uh investor who's kind of on the fence and they don't want to jump off the fence because they're uncertain if they're actually going to make money on that deal right so I would continuously always tell all my guys what your end of the day, what you're really selling, both on the seller side, but more importantly on the buyer side, if you're wholesaling right, what you're really selling is certainty. That what the value that you're giving to the end buyer is a legitimate exit strategy value. Okay, now are you 100% that you're gonna hit that strike price? Not necessarily, but instead of you pounding your chest and saying, hey, the resale value is gonna be here, when you can actually have a third party say that the resale value is at this price because you actually got it at, that's when you change the game. Right, so, so we would do a lot of that, and I highly recommend if you're in a competitive marketplace, if you're starting off, is to start looking at uh, even hard money lenders or either private investors that, that can work with you. And when I say private investors, okay, make sure that these hard money lenders are actually using their capital. I'm, I'm talking about they're not brokering off the money to someone else, because a lot of hard money lenders, what they'll do is if you app with them, meaning you send an application to them, they don't have the money raised, so they have to go around after you get the application, they approve your 
actual loan. They have to come behind the scene and then they're raising the money from their private money investors. Okay? So if you do that, this method won't work. But if it's their money, meaning like it's their actual line of credit, their funds that they're using, then you can actually talk to them and do what they call an assumption method. So something that I even taught our actual hard money lender. I said, look, look at these loan docs. This is how we're closing it. And if you can do this, we'll be able to do a lot more volume and a lot more deals. So what, what the transaction really happens is that the contract is under our entity name. We'll go ahead and get a hard money loan, literally approved, and tell us, hey, what amount you have to come to the closing table for. And that loan docs are ready to be pulled. So we end up selling uh, wholesaling the transaction, we wholesale it at par, meaning that we don't attach an assignment fee, and then we invoice our assignment fee on the buyer side, so it doesn't show up on the closing statement on the seller side, and then from there, we have a clause with the hard money lender that basically says, hey, we are not personally guaranteeing this loan, our company's not guaranteeing this loan, but it's going to be assumed by this actual end buyer. And that end buyer will actually have to sign an actual, uh, an assumption document, um, uh, signing basically says, hey, we're gonna take and assume all the responsibility of the loan docs that we're signing. So when this transaction happens, guess what? We go in and we sign the loan docs, and then the loan docs, gets sent over to the end buyer, they review it, they're cool, and then they sign off and they get a notarized document called an assumption agreement. And boom, once that happens, guess what? The lender will fund the deal, we close on the deal under our name, and then we will deed the property over to the end buyer. And then when we deed the property over, guess what? They're taking over the actual uh, loan and we're off the hook. We already got paid because it closed, and then boom, we're off to our next deal. And that's how we've closed a lot of our deals doing it that way. And you can still do that even with the end retail buyer. Uh, that's taking a private money loan. Because a lot of times people say, oh yeah, you can only wholesale to cash buyer, which is far from the truth. You can actually wholesale to people that are taking hard money loans. You just have to structure it in a way that is favorable to you, but also favorable to the lender and that's favorable to the cash buyers. And so kind of wrapping this up as I'm actually literally parked in front of my house is that can you actually do deals without any cash, any credit or experience? The answer, short answer is 100% yes. Yes, but the asterisk is next to the experience because you're going to have to have experience to be able to put a deal together, especially if you're inexperienced in terms of how to navigate the trenches. Otherwise, you're going to run into challenges. Now, if it has a like a ginormous spread, okay, with all means, you shouldn't have any challenges. But if it's a marginal deal, all right, then you're going to need some experience in there. And I highly recommend individuals always to reach out someone locally who has done deals that can actually help you put the deal together. And if you have never done a deal or only done several deals, I recommend individuals to just even give them all of your assignment fee if you have to. So that way, at least you learn how to do it the right way. Okay, and I cannot stress that enough. I did that in the early stages when I had to come back in the game and I didn't have experience um, back in 08. Um, you know, I did a lot of stuff even with my mentor that I went back where I made literally pennies on um, the work that I did. But the actual experience that I got out of that has been priceless. And um, that's what I have for you guys and gals because, again, I got that message from uh, the gal that was listening to this podcast and saying, hey, it's cool to know someone in Southern California that's doing deals and kind of doing this for her and someone else that's new that's trying to break into the game is to know that, hey, this state of California, the Republic of California is quirky, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll end with this is a kind of a quick story where um, a couple years ago, um, I actually got a call from Department of uh, Real Estate, California Department of Real Estate. And they reached out to me. And when they reached out to me, I thought at first I did something wrong. I was very afraid and I got scared. And I was like, damn, I don't know if I should even talk to this person uh, without an actual attorney. And um, I ended up just talking to them and I come to find out they reached out to me because they heard me on the podcast where I was talking a lot about fiduciary responsibility um, when it comes to working with real estate agents right if you're wholesaling and uh, one of the episodes that they listened to ages ago um, she said that she liked the way that I had my transaction covered and she said that I sounded like the most knowledgeable individual in California when it comes to structuring wholesale deals now clearly I don't know if I am or not I know for a fact probably and the fact that you know on the 
internet. It might come off that way. I do know a lot. Um, but looking back now, you know, um, she was just genuinely interested in how I was doing it. So I told her how I was doing it. Not only that, but I even sent her the contracts that I was using. And I explained to them that I said, hey, if I'm working with real estate agents, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, my real estate agents that I work with, okay, they do not get listing agreements with sellers. And she said, why? And I was just like, well, because if they get a listing agreement, they have fiduciary responsibility to seller. So if they have fiduciary responsibility to seller, then not only am I putting their license at risk, but also I'm putting the broker's license at risk. Why is because the broker owns the listing, not the person that the real estate agent that has the license. Okay. The licensee, like the real estate sales agent, right? It's not their listing legally. Okay. It's the actual broker's listing. So the person who's at risk is the broker. Okay. So, so I said, I don't want to do any bad business. So I don't want them to be fiduciary responsible uh, to the seller. So my team agents use something called the single party compensation agreement. And what that does is literally put all the liability on the buyer side and the agent does not represent the seller. There is no fiduciary responsibility with the seller. So when we do the closing statement, when we calculate the net to seller, it's a lot easier to do. So when we use that contract, we say, hey, the actual buyer is going to pay the agent a fee and that there's no responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to seller. So now if I decide to wholesale the deal, okay, and something happens or if the seller claims that, hey, you know what, um, there were much higher offers on the table and I end up wholesaling, then he's not on hook or she's not on hook for that, right? So I'm explaining this to them. And then I said, I have an addendum with that, that actually stipulate exactly what I'm doing, um, that I have the right to actually remarket and resell the property to a third party individual. And I even have on the addendum to actually, I even have the legal right to actually post it up on the MLS. Okay. So it's an addendum that I have. And then I'll actually have the seller sign an affidavit of understanding. That's a notarized document stating that, Hey, you know what? The seller understands what the heck that I'm doing and they have to initial and actually sign it. Okay. And with that, I'll actually even have a seller sign a memorandum of agreement stating that, Hey, this agreement exists between me, the buyer, and then the seller. All right. Now there's two notarized document that's in place. Okay. Now those documents protects me one for any open exposure. And then two, the memorandum of agreement allows me to record a cloud on title. Uh, so that way no buyers can actually go around me and to try to snatch a deal right behind me. Right. So, so again, those things that, that I do to protect myself, not only for, you know, open exposure, but also at the same time, I want to protect my team agent is what I do. Right. So again, those are some of the things that, that you got to be aware of to do. Okay. Now, do I do that? A hundred percent of the time, though all those contracts and stuff like that, not necessarily. Okay, I do it about ninety percent of the time. Now, what is that ten percent that I don't do it? That ten percent I don't do it is one. If it becomes way too cumbersome to actually get a memorandum of agreement or an affidavit understanding notarized, meaning that if they're in a place like let's just say they're incarcerated or something like that, or the beneficiary in a trust is all over the country, right? Then it's hard for me to do. Then then I won't push it. Okay, but I will not get a listing signed if it's a deal that I feel as though legitimately I'm getting a massive, massive discount on, okay? Why is because the last thing I want is someone to come back and says, hey, Jeff, you took advantage of this poor seller when you wholesale that and made $50,000, $100,000 or whatever it is, okay? So even though, hey, you know, I'm a capitalist by heart. Okay? So I think any wholesaler should make the maximum amount of money, but you got to protect yourself. And that's my recommendation. You got to get that experience. And uh, um, there's a lot of crap out there in the internet land and uh, people claim to be doing it right. But in my opinion, I don't think that they are. So again, get that experience, get a local, local person, get someone that knows or have done it. And then from there, learn from them. That's the fastest way to gain experience. I'm in my opinion. So that's what I got for you on this quick rant here. If you enjoyed this actual episode, let me know or shoot out, leave a comment and, uh, even reach out to me personally, uh, to let me know, because if you do, then I'll do more of these types of topical based based on the messages that I get personally because I know you guys and gals are listening and I hope that you guys know that I'm listening when you guys reach out to me and this is what I'm doing um, so I can keep on serving the community that's been uh, so great to me. So that's what I got. This is Jeff Koga. Uh, go out there, keep on hustling, keep on grinding.